Hello and welcome to another fascinating episode of the Courageous Conversations with Hemant Das. I'm a senior research associate at South Asia Research Institute for Minorities. Today I have the privilege of speaking with Dr. Sohaini Sara Pillai, a scholar of South Asian religious traditions and literature. Dr. Pillai is an assistant professor of religion and director of film and media studies at the Klomozo College, where she shares her passion for epics like Mahabharata and Ramayana. Through thought-provoking courses, her expertise lie in comparatively analyzing these grand narratives across diverse linguistic and cultural contexts in South Asia. And we are in for a real treat today as Dr. Pillai joins us to discuss her pioneering new book from Oxford University Press, uh, Krishna's Mahabharata's devotional retelling of an epic narrative. Uh, this groundbreaking book and her work offers an in-depth exploration on how modern regional poets reimagine the ancient Sanskrit Mahabharata the epic is a staring expression of the devotion of Hindu deity Krishna. By closely examining the author, 15th century Tamil and 17th century Bhasha or Old Hindu version, Dr. Pillai reveals the ways these authors transformed an epic about a dynastic war into a Krishna centric poem suffused with bhakti, the tradition of inpatient devotion. Her book also unreveals the shared innovation while also highlighting the retellings unique and caring in its regional literary or literature context. Not only does Krishna's Mahabharat shed light on the understudied masterpieces of South Asian religious literature, but it also opens up fascinating perspectives on issues like gender, power hierarchies, and intersection of social identities with devotional tradition. Uh, and I must not forget to mention that Soini has the exclusive book up. She is going to bless us with a promo code of 30% of her book from the publisher in Oxford. You know, I will be attaching the flare at the end of this interview and also sharing the link below to make your buying easy. Uh, so without any further ado, uh, so let's get uh, ready to swap up with the wondrous word of Krishna's Mahabharata. Dr. Pai, welcome to the show and thank you very, very much for joining us today. And uh, I will start by asking you that your book focuses on the regional language retellings of Mahabharata from 800 to 1700 CE. They transformed the epic into devotional work centered on the Hindu god Krishna. Uh, what motivated writers and you across the South Asia to undertake these Krishna-centric retellings? Well, first, let me thank you so much for um, having me on this podcast. Um, it's such a delight to be here and to get to um, talk with you, and especially the work that your organization is doing. Um, it's really incredible, and it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, so answering this question might be a little easier if I describe the book a little bit, right? So my book focuses on the Mahabharata epic narrative tradition. And the oldest and most famous Mahabharata is the ancient Sanskrit Mahabharata, which tells um, the story of the five Pandava princes and the apocalyptic battle they wage with their 100 cousins, the Kauravas. Um, it's this really um, horrific kind of battle in which 1.6 billion people are dead at the end of this battle, right? Um, but while the Sanskrit Mahabharata may be the oldest Mahabharata, it is certainly not the only Mahabharata. So between the 9th and 17th centuries of the Common Era alone, um, a plethora of Mahabharatas were composed in Assamese, Bengali, um, Pasha or Old Hindi, Gujarati, Kannada, Konkani, Malayalam, Marathi, Oriya, Tamar, Telugu, and nearly every regional South Asian language, right? And so in my book, I argue that Vaishnavas, devotees of um, Vishnu and his various forms throughout the subcontinent compo compose Mahabharata retellings in regional languages in order to express bhakti or devotion to the very popular Hindu deity Krishna. So although the divine Krishna does play a vital role in the Sanskrit Mahabharata as the Pandava's advisor and the bestower of the Bhagavad Gita, right, um, he isn't the protagonist of the Sanskrit epic, not in the same way that, say, Rama is the protagonist of the Ramayana tradition. Um, we have huge chunks of the Sanskrit Mahabharata where Krishna doesn't make a single appearance, right? It's the Pandavas who are the heroes of the Mahabharata, not Krishna. But this isn't the case, however, for several pre-modern Mahabharata retellings in regional languages. So in my book, while I examine over 40 regional retellings that were written between 800 and 1700 CE in 11 different regional South Asian languages, I do focus on two particular Mahabharatas, which you mentioned. Um, so the first is Viliputra's 15th century Tamil Bharata, and the other is Sabal Singh Chauhan's 17th century Bhasha or Old Hindi Mahabharata. 
So between um, you know roughly 500 and 1800 CE, nearly every South Asian literary culture produced its own unique corpus of bhakti songs and compositions focused on this intimate and personal relationship between the devotee and the divine. And Krishna was central to many of these flourishing bhakti devotional traditions. So if we're just thinking about old Hindi or Basha, we have Surtas, we have Mirabai. In Tamar, um, we have Peria Alvar, we have Andal. Um, and the list goes on for multiple different literary um, bhakti cultures, right? There are many poets throughout South Asia who are writing um, these beautiful devotional poems about Krishna. And so I think this is likely why we find so many Krishna-centric Mahabharatas in regional languages, but it's a very interesting switch because, as I said earlier, um, while Krishna is, is definitely an important character in the Sanskrit Mahabharata, he's not the protagonist of the text like he is, say, in um, the Bhagavata Purana, for example, um, or the Harivamsha, right? Um, he's more of this like important advisor character. With my students in the U.S., I often use the analogy. He's kind of like Obi-Wan Kenobi in Star Wars or Dumbledore in Harry Potter. He's a very important character, but he's not the protagonist. So it's interesting. And again, with my students, I'm like, it's as if suddenly Harry Potter is breaking out into songs of praise of Dumbledore throughout the text and the story is told from Dumbledore's perspective. So um, it's uh, it, it's a very interesting kind of phenomenon we're seeing. And it's happening across South Asia that these poets are retelling the Mahabharata with Krishna as um, kind of the central focus of their retellings. Uh, you know, Dr. Ply, you work under takes a comparative study of Mahabharata retellings in Tamil and Bhasha, which is known as a old Sanskrit. What were the challenges and insights you gained from employing a comparative approach across these linguistically and culturally diverse narratives? So I get this question um, a lot because um, the two languages um, I work with from Hindu, um, which are two languages that often aren't put into conversation with each other. Delay, Tamil family. Um, my mother's Anglo-Indian from Bangalore. Um, so I grew up in a multi-religious household where different languages were being spoken. My parents both speak Bengali because they both lived in Kolkata for a long time. My dad went to high school there. Um, and I didn't grow up speaking Tamar. I learned it in graduate school, actually, though my Pati, my family would speak Tamil. Um, the language I spoke most growing up or learned, and then I continued to study in um, college and grad school is Hindi from watching Bollywood films in the US, right? And so because of my own cultural background um, and uh, kind of growing up surrounded by Hindi and other ways that the language both my parents spoke, um, that's why I personally became interested in these two languages. But I think a lot can be gained from looking at texts in these two different languages. So. Um, like you said, my book offers a, a detailed comparative study of bhakti compositions in Bhasha and Tamar. They're two of South Asia's most vibrant regional languages, but they're seen as completely distinct, right, in terms of their linguistic, geographic, and literary trajectories. And although bhakti is considered a unifying element of Hindu religious traditions across South Asia, there have been very few attempts to compare works of bhakti literature composed in different regional languages. So these poems um, of Vili Putra, or Vili, as I call him, uh, many people call him that, and uh, Subhul Singh Johan, I'll refer to him as Johan to make things easier, um, they provide us this unique opportunity to carefully examine how a bhakti mahabharata composed in Tamar both resembles and differs from a bhakti mahabharata composed in Basha. Um, and so my study of these two texts simultaneously highlights large-scale trends in pre-modern bhakti poetry, but it also situates them in their historical and regional specificities. And again, my main reason for selecting these retellings, other than my own personal interest in these two literary cultures, um, is based on the languages in which they're composed. So I think um, more so than any other regions in South Asia, North India and South India are seen as consistently completely different entities, right? And thanks in part to modern language politics, the same is also true for the Indo-Aryan North Indian language Hindi and the Dravidian South Indian language Tamar. So I decided to compare these two retellings in order to see what they can teach us about the larger regional Mahabharata tradition. Um, and so Billy and Johan's texts are not mutually relatable on implicit or innate grounds, but putting these poems in conversation with each other reveals several striking similarities that wouldn't exist without comparison. And so let me highlight some of those. So both of these poems are the most widely known Mahabharata retellings, um, pre-modern Mahabharata retellings of their respective literary cultures. And they're described in all of the major Tamar and Hindi literary histories. Um, both texts have had active lives in manuscript and print culture um, during my fieldwork and in India and both editions of both texts. Well. And that's just um, from I different identified archives, you know, in smaller of the Bharatam and 40 manuscripts of the Mahabharata. archives and libraries, there could be more manuscripts of both of these texts. 
What's especially important in contemporary India is these Mahabharatas have also inspired living performance traditions. So Vili's Tamil Bharatam is an important source for the Pirasangam Bharatam, or the discourse on the Mahabharata discourses, um, recitations, and the Terukutu, or street theater plays of devotees of a Draupadi goddess community in the northern region of Tamil Nadu. Um, in Chhattisgarh, in central India, excerpts from Chahan's Basha Mahabharata have been incorporated into the Vedmati form of Pandavani, um, valid performances of different caste oppressed and Adivasi or indigenous groups, as well as the chanting rituals of the Ram Namis, who are a religious community of Dalits who um, take Tulsi Das's Basha Ram Charitmanas as their central deity. Um, not Rama, but the text, which is very interesting. Um, and so um, both of these texts are very important for different living performance traditions, and that's how we see them um, in contemporary India today, mostly. Um, Vili and Johan also both claim courtly patrons. So Vili praises a local chieftain named Barapati Atkondan, um, who is um, active in the, or who ruled in the uh, Tirumuni Parinaru region in Tamil Nadu. Um, and Chauhan continuously extols a king by the name of Mitrasen, so this is a, a Hindu-sounding name, but he also praises the sixth Mughal emperor, Aurangzeb, in his Mahabharat, um, and I'll, I think I'll talk about that a little bit more, um, because it's the, the perceptions we have of Aurangzeb are very interesting, um, especially in contemporary South Asia, and the fact that this Hindu bhakti poet is praising this Mughal emperor who has a certain reputation, again, I'll talk about this more, I think, um, is really fascinating. But the most striking similarity is the central role that Krishna plays in both of these regional Mahabharatas. You know, since we talked about the comparative reading and analysis, uh, I, would, um, I have seen that you have uh, chose particularly two texts, Liputra's 15th century Tamil Paratam and Sabha Singh Chuan's 17th century Bhasha, known as Old Hindi Mahabharata. Can you highlight some of the key similarities and differences in how these writers recast the Mahabharata as a Krishna devotional narrative? Sure. Um, so my book is divided into three parts. Um, excuse me, in the first part of my book, um, I, talk, I have to kind of give the groundwork for um, how Krishna is presented in the Sanskrit Mahabharata. And it's very interesting how he's presented because sometimes he's presented as this all-powerful god. Sometimes he's presented as this very kind of human character who can't prevent this horrific war. And in part one, I also talk about these uh, 40 different regional Mahabharata retellings in these 11 different languages. But part two of my book, so that's chapters three and four, um, it focuses on shared narrative transformation in these two texts. And what I do is I examine four of the same sections of these regional Mahabharatas uh, side by side. So at the start of each of their Mahabharatas, both Vili and Jahan describe themselves narrating the Sanskrit Mahabharata in regional languages. Um, but they also go on to classify their retellings as Krishna Charitas, or works that relate the deeds of Krishna. Now, this is a very interesting designation to give the Mahabharata. Again, there were multiple regional Mahabharatas that were actually bared the name um, Pandava Charita, right? It's the deeds of the Pandavas. But both of these poets and multiple other regional poets either call their stories Krishna Charitas, Krishna Katha, right? Uh, even Krishna Purana, right? Using these terms, classifying the Mahabharata as a story of Krishna, which is so fascinating. And so in part two of this book, I demonstrate how Vili and Johan recast this tale of this horrific war between the two factions of the Bharata dynasty as a narrative of emotional bhakti about Krishna and his deeds. So in chapter three, I closely compare the first and final books of the Tamil Bharatam and the Vacha Mahabharat with a focus on Krishna's debuts and departures in each text, right? So both of these poets is very interesting. They both introduce Krishna into the narrative much earlier than he's introduced in the Sanskrit Mahabharata. We first really see Krishna in the Sanskrit Mahabharata at Draupadi's Swayamvara, right? Her bridegroom yeah. choice ceremony. And he's just sitting there and he, he points to Balrama and he's like, hey, look, they're the Pandavas, they're disguised. But um, Billy and Johan both introduce him earlier. So Billy introduces him right after the Pandavas uh, return to Hastinapura with their mother after Pandu and Madri's death. And Krishna comes with his family. And it makes sense because Krishna, um, his father, Vasudeva, is Kunti's brother. And they come to check up on her. And he looks at them and he's like, I'm going to protect these guys. You know, something I'm paraphrasing here. And then in the Basha text, Krishna is introduced in the fire in the Lak Palace, the Wax Palace. Um, because he is the one who saves the Pandavas from this fire. It's not Bhima carrying everyone on his back, but it's actually Krishna who saves them. So they're both introducing Krishna much earlier in the narrative. The, de the departures are interesting because they're quite different from each other. So um, in the Sanskrit Mahabharata, Krishna dies in this really depressing and kind of horrific manner, right? Um, Gandhari, after the war, um, the Korova's mother, she um, pronounces this curse, right? That everyone in Krishna's family will kill each other. And it comes um, to be 36, later, 36 years later um, when all of the Yadavas um, kill each other in this drunken brawl, right? And Krishna sees his son die, he sees his family members die, um, and it's just so horrible. Um, and Krishna himself 
is killed when a hunter mistakes his foot for the ear of an animal, right? And so he's quite like Achilles in the sense that there's a certain part of his body that's vulnerable, um, and that's his um, his leg, because there's a story about him being uh, dipped in this kind of um, magical biasum, and but his ankle wasn't dipped in, and so that part is vulnerable, right? And so, and, and so it's just horrible. Like, Krishna dies by mistake because a hunter mistakes his foot for um, an animal. Um, Vili and many other Sri Vaishnava South Indian poets don't want to talk about Krishna's death, right? So the Thummer text and um, right after the war, right? So Krishna, he, he um, crowns Yudhishthira and then he's like, I'm going back to Dvarka, bye, and the text ends. Um, in Chauhan's text, we get the same kind of horrible ending we see in the Sanskrit Mahabharata, but then ironically in the next book of the text, suddenly Krishna's alive again when the Pandavas go to Dvarka um, to ask for advice about their journey to heaven. So very different endings, but both of these poets clearly make the, um, the ending of their text a devotional narrative with Krishna as the focus, even though they're very different endings. Um, in my fourth chapter of my book, I analyzed, I think, two of the most disturbing sequences in the Sanskrit Mahabharata in both of these retellings. The first is the attempted disrobing um, of the Pandava's shared wife, Draupadi, and the second is the entire fifth book of each text. Um, in Sanskrit, it's the Udhyoga Parvan, uh, the Book of Effort, um, which is about the preparations uh, for the great Mahabharata war. So while my book demonstrates that these regional Mahabharatas are unique pieces of religious literature anchored in specific bhakti contexts, I also show that each of these Mahabharatas are linked to a specific regional Vaishnava bhakti literary culture. And so for Billy, that's the South Indian Sri Vaishnava corpus. And for Chauhan, it's Tulsi Das's collection of Bhasha Ramayana compositions. Um, and so the third and final part of my book, I focus on the relationship between these Vaishnava cultures and each of these Mahabharatas. So in chapter five, I argue that Billy uses invocations to Krishna and other forms of Vishnu um, to firmly anchor his Mahabharata in um, the Sri Vaishnava Bhakti um, literary tradition. And in chapter six, I uh, contend that the prevalence of certain types of allusions to the Ramayana narrative tradition in this Bhakti Mahabharata identified Johan as both the devotee of Rama and a connoisseur of, again, the 16th century Rama-centric -cent Pasha poetry of Tulsi Das. Um, and I demonstrate this with examinations of three types of Ramayana allusions in this text. The first is invocations to Rama and other Ramayana figures. Um, the second is episodes in Chauhan's narrative in which Rama's most cherished um, devotee Hanuman comes to the aid of Arjuna. We do see Hanuman in the Sanskrit Mahabharata because he's Bhima's half-brother. Um, but very interestingly in this text, it's Arjuna and um, Hanuman's relationship, which is um, the focal point. And we see this in some other regional Mahabharatas as well, but Chauhan really kind of focuses on Hanuman and Arjuna in these really interesting ways. And then the third way I show this is, is the passages in which Johan equates Krishna with Rama. So for example, at the end of the text, when the Pandavas reach heaven, um, and it's it's not just Svarga, like it is in the Sanskrit Mahabharata, it's Vaikuntha, it's Vishnu's heaven. Um, but it's not Vishnu who's in heaven, it's Rama. Specifically, Rama is the one sitting in heaven. So it's, it's really interesting having this a Mahabharata composed by a devotee of Rama and Tulsidas. See, uh, since you uh, touch upon the contemporary relevance of these epic retellings, I really would like to know how do modern adaptations such as television shows, online content continue the tradition of emphasizing Krishna's divinity? And what does this say about the ongoing impact of these devotional narratives? Sure. So, um, you know, ever since the first broadcast of Veer Chopra's immensely popular Hindi Mahabharata television series from um, 1988 to 1990, it's one of my first memories of the Mahabharata is watching this TV show. Um, there have been several television Mahabharatas. Um, I've also done a bit of work on uh, television Mahabharatas as well. It's super fascinating. Um, and I discussed some of these TV Mahabharatas and the role Krishna plays in many of these serials, right? So first, um, again, we have to remember that these childhood stories of Krishna in Vrindavan, so Putana, right? Um, the story of his battle with Kamsa, romancing the gopis, they are not really in the critical edition of the Sanskrit Mahabharata much at all, right? There might be a reference to Krishna killing Putana or Kamsa in just like one line, but we don't get narratives of these stories in the Sanskrit Mahabharata. So what the first TV Mahabharata, Dudarshan's original Hindi Mahabharata did was they dedicated nine episodes solely to Krishna's childhood in Vrindavan. And that's not, again, it's not in the Sanskrit Mahabharata, but they showed the Pandava's childhood and children and Krishna's childhood at the same time, right? And this is also true for 9X, uh, 9X's 2008 Hindi Kahani Hamare Mahabharati, which was a, a flop, um, but a very interesting show. Um, Star Plus's 2013 to 2014 Hindi Mahabharata, right? Some people called it the Star Bharat. Um, and also in Thummer, we have Sun TV's 2013 to 2016 Mahabharatam show. So again, we see Krishna's childhood in these shows as well. He's also a prominent figure in Star Plus's 2018 to 2019 Hindi Karn Sangini, right? He's also a big character in Suri Putra Karn as well. I think in like the 
almost like the later half of the episodes, it's Krishna who starts the narration of the story, right? In Surya Putra Karn. Um, and in the conclusion of my book, I closely analyzed Draupadi's disrobing scene in um, a Hindi serial called Draupadi, which aired um, in 2016 on Durdarshan Kisan, um, which is one of Durdarshan's multiple national cha uh, channels. And this show established Krishna as a major character as early as the second episode when Drupada Draupadi's father is like lifting up his newborn baby. He lifts it to the sky. We see Krishna blessing her from the clouds. He's playing his flute, which is an instrument synonymous with Krishna, right? Um, and he goes on to appear in 57 more episodes of this television series that is ostensibly about the deeds of Draupadi. Um, and so in many ways, Draupadi and other modern television shows I discuss in the conclusion of my book are Bhakti Mahabharatas akin to these pre-modern regional retellings of Vili and Johan. But I'll just add um, that we're seeing a lot of censorship of, of films and TV shows and, and outrage about films and movies. So I'm just thinking about the backlash uh, with Adi Purush, right? And how like even when the trailer came out, people were so upset because the actors weren't um, wearing costumes similar to what they're wearing in Ramanan Sagar's Ramayan and stuff. And so while there is this these kind of cool innovations in multiple TV shows, I'm not sure if we're going to be seeing these innovations in, in future shows, which makes me quite a bit sad. And, and even thinking about, for example, um, how Mahasweta Devi's short story Draupadi was being censored at Delhi University. Um, this uh, short film, Hindi film, Mama's Boys, was had it, I think, Aditi Roy Hydri, was taken off of YouTube because there were there was backlash against that as well, and that's Mahabharata retelling. Um, and so I hope we'll continue to see new innovative television and film Mahabharatas, um, but I wouldn't be surprised if we don't, given the current kind of... Um, uh, you know, since we uh, live in the world of internet, uh, you also talked about your uh, online content and how uh, television influences the retelling of Mahabharata. Considering, uh, considering the central focus on Bhakti in your work, see the themes of devotion intersecting with the social and caste dynamic present within the Mahabharata's narrative, uh, especially in the regional retelling by the Viliputar and Chuan. Yeah, I'm so happy you asked this question because it's such an important one. So I think... First, it's just vital um, that we acknowledge um, that for many contemporary Dalits, Adivasis, and other caste-oppressed communities, um, communities, the Sanskrit epics are violent and harmful narratives. So, for instance, there's a story in the first book of the Sanskrit Mahabharata in which the Pandavas and their mother Kunti get six people from the Nishada Adivasi community drunk, and then they murder these six Nishadas in order to fake their own death, right? And the text just, like, completely glosses over that. Um, it's this horrific scene. Right, where there's um, Kunti and the Pandavas invite a Nishada woman and her five sons, they feed them lots of food, they get them drunk, and then they let them burn to death. Um, and it's a horrifically violent story. Another well known story from the first book of the Sanskrit Mahabharata that many people are familiar with is that of the caste oppressed Nishada prince Ekalavya, right? A skilled archer who's cruelly tricked by the caste privileged Brahmin teacher Drona into cutting off his right thumb, right, as an honorarium. And, and Drona's not even the one who taught him. It's a mud statue of Drona, but still he cuts off his thumb, right? And so Dalit rights activist and scholar Tenwari um, Sundara Rajan, she's actually the first scholar um, I quote in my book, and that was very intentional. Um, she's recently described the anger she felt upon encountering the story from the Sanskrit Mahabharata for the first time. And um, I quote here, she says, the moral here is that caste oppressed students like in the indigenous Eklavia must always humble themselves before Brahminical educational structures. I remember reading that story and being outraged. Why was this being taught as a moral parable? End quote. And so I can only imagine how horrific it is um, for Dalit and Adivasi communities in school being taught this story of Ekalavya as this kind of ideal student who cuts up his thumb for the Brahmin teacher. And like um, Tenwari says, it's this really horrific kind of story. And why is this being taught as a moral parable? So I'll admit, I was pleasantly surprised to find that the story of Ekalavya is not, is nowhere to be found in the first book of Chohan's Basha of Mahabharat. Um, I want to be very careful here. I don't want to make any sweeping claims that because Ekalavya is absent from Chohan's Basha Mahabharata, that this means that Chohan was progressive or supportive of caste oppressed people. I, I don't have enough information to make those arguments, but it is fascinating that this story is missing from Chohan's text. Um, we've like, um, it's interesting if we're thinking about the Ramayana tradition, some of the Ramayanas by female authors don't have the stories of Ahalya or Shurpanaka, right? So Shurpanaka, especially this Rakshasa woman who is mutilated because of the race or community she belongs to um, and sexually assaulted, right? The story is not in a Ramayana by um, a woman poet, right? It's, I think we should make note of these interesting omissions, but we need to be careful about arguments we're making about the historical past, because unless we have a time machine and we can go back and interview these poets, we really don't know the reason why they're not including these stories, but we should certainly take note of when these stories are missing, and also when we see additions to the text. So in the Sanskrit Mahabharata, Karna, the secret elder brother of the Pandavas, also uh, Duryodhana's best friend, um, and he dies and fights alongside the Korvas, um, 
he's one of the most beloved characters of the Mahabharata tradition. Um, many retellings, including the ancient Sanskrit um, Karnapada, uh, attributed to Basha, the um, excuse me, Pasa, the uh, Sanskrit playwright, uh, Rabindranath Tagore's 1899 Bengali poem, um, Karna Kunti Sambod, um, and N.T. Rama Rao's 1977 Telugu film, Dana Shura Karna, right? They celebrate Karna's honesty, his generosity, and his loyalty. And the same is also true for Vili Stamabharatam. Karna is especially beloved in South India. Um, and so now, although Karna, we know he's a biological son of Surya, the sun deity, and the Pandava's mother Kunti, but he's raised by the caste-oppressed Sutta charioteer, Adiratta, and his wife Radha, right? And Suttas are a caste-oppressed community um, of charioteers and bards, and they're caste oppressed because their parents belong to two different caste privileged groups. And we know that this kind of mixing of castes was looked down upon, right? And so um, their parents are either Brahmins, priests, or Kshatriyas, uh, warriors. And so throughout the Sanskrit Mahabharata, we see Karna being discriminated because of his caste status, right? I think one of the most popular examples, which isn't actually in the critical edition of the Sanskrit Mahabharata, is when Draupadi refuses to let Karna take play, uh, participate in the Slayamvara, right? Because she says, I'm not marrying the son of a Sutta, right? Because of his caste. In Billy's Samabhartham, there's a very interesting scene when Duryodhana defends Karna when the Brahmin teacher Kripa says Karna should not be allowed to participate in an archery contest because he was born a Sutta. And it's, Duryodhana gives this very interesting reply. He says, Vishnu was once born from a pillar as the man lion Narsimha. Shiva was born from bamboo. Agastya and Drona were born from pots. Um, and Murugan, uh, Katikeya and, and Kripa himself were born from reeds. And Duryodhana is basically saying um, that you know, all of these deities and respected teachers have these bizarre births, right? So Krish Karna, if he has this lowly birth, this shouldn't um, prevent him from competing in the competition with Kshatriyas. And again, I, I want to be careful. I don't want to make any sweeping claims that Duryodhana was like a Dalit rights activist or something, right? Because again, these are older texts in different historical contexts. But I still think it's very interesting that we find this scene in which Duryodhana defends um, Karna and his um, caste status, which is really interesting. Oh, yeah, uh, that's really interesting to know that. And it is fascinating to know something new. Uh, you know, the Bhakti moment in your book is known for its emphasis on the devotion or class or social status. How do the Tamil or Bhasha Mahabharats reflect or contribute to this aspect of Bhakti tradition? Do these texts offer any commentary on the social hierarchy of their times? Yeah, that's it. I'm really glad you asked this question again. And, and especially that you brought up this phrase, Bhakti movement, right? So in Hindi, Bhakti Andolan. Um, until very recently in scholarship on South Asian literature, the word bhakti has been inextricably linked to a pan-South Asian bhakti movement that is said to have begun around you know, the 6th century with Shaiva and Vaishnava poetry in Tamil-speaking South India, before spreading all over the subcontinent and reaching its zenith with Bhasha Vaishnava literature in North India nearly 1,000 years later. And since the bhaktas or devotees associated with the bhakti movement include women, Muslims, Sikhs and Dalits, the Bhakti movement is often seen as progressive and populist. Um, but um, my mentor and um, a professor who is a member of my dissertation committee, John Stratton Hawley, Jack Hawley, um, he's convincingly demonstrated that this pervasive and popular notion of a single Bhakti movement is a historical construct with distinctly North Indian roots that only really fully crystallized in the first half of the 20th century. Um, building on Jack's scholarship, um, another uh, scholar of um, religious literature in South Asia, Patton Burchett, suggests, and I'm going to quote him here, he suggests that we would be better served to imagine that at different times, each of the various regions of India had its own distinctive multivocal bhakti movement shaped by regionally and historically specific social, political, and cultural factors. And I think that's um, an interesting way to go about thinking about um, bhakti in South Asia is with different regional bhakti movements, but there, are, there could also be some issues with that. So several scholars have created periodization models for Tamil and Hindi poetry in which a period of history is defined based on what was supposedly the main type of literature produced during that time period. So the dates of the bhakti period for Tamil poetry are usually given as 500 to 900 CE. The poets of this period or category include certain members of the 63 Shaiva Nainmar, um, the Shaiva Bhakta uh, Manika Vasakar, and the 12 Vaishnava poets known as the Alvars. And notably, some of these poets are described um, in hagiographical texts as coming from caste-oppressed communities. So, for example, according to various Sri Vaishnava hagiographies, Thirupan Alvar um, was a Dalit singer belonging to the Panar community who was carried into Vishnu's temple, the inner sanctum of the temple at Sri Rangam, by a Brahmin on his back. So, the hagiographical, hagiographical traditions tell us that Thirupan Alvar was a Panar, was from a caste-oppressed community. 
in his highly influential 1929 Hindi Sahitya Ka Itihas, or the history of Hindi literature, um, Ramchandra Shukla states that the early medieval period, so the Purva Madhya Kal, from 1318 to 1643 CE, so kind of very specific dates, was the Bhakti period, was the Bhakti Kal. Um, and again, some of these Bhakti poets are described as coming from caste oppressed or marginalized communities. So a very famous example would be Rai Das, Ravi Das, right? Um, Kabir, right? Supposedly born in a Muslim community of weavers, right? But I think that these models that um, conflate periodization with categorization can be quite problematic. So neither Vili nor Chauhan were active during the so-called bhakti periods of their respective literary cultures. But as I show in my book and as we've been discussing today, both of these regional Mahabharatas are filled with bhakti, right? Bhakti works of South Asian literature were not only composed in the so-called bhakti periods or bhakti movements of their respective literary cultures. So I'm sorry to go on a, a tangent there, but I think it's important that we complicate and challenge terms like the bhakti movement especially because because Muslims, Dalits, women, Sikh are included in this category, it could be um, used in harmful and dangerous ways, right? Being like, oh, Hindu bhakti poetry has always been so inclusive because we have these um, Dalit poets, because we have female poets, right? But I think we need to look at these categories more carefully and be, and be careful about the arguments we're making about them, right? Because depending on who's appropriating these terms, um, there can be kind of um, dangerous consequences, I think. But to get back to your question, while I've seen many similarities between the poetry of Billy and specifically um, two Tamil Alvars, Nama Alvar and Peri Alvar, who are both past privileged Alvars, right? Um, as well as between the poetry of Chauhan and Tulsidas, and Tulsidas makes it very clear he's um, a caste privileged Brahmin. There are parts of the Ram that you know certain scholars like to quote, where it seems like he's being quite sexist. Um, and we have characters um, like Guha and, and Shabri, and uh, in these in the Ram Charitmanas, both of these you know cast press characters are very um, like full of bhakti towards Rama, and Rama eats with them, or he calls them his brother, or different kinds of things. But again, we have to be careful about these kinds of stories and how they're being used, right? Yes, Rama eats with Shabri, or Rama uh, goes on a boat with um, Guha, or the Kevat boatmen, right? But there's clearly a clear caste hierarchy in these characters, right? Rama is seen as being much higher than Shabri. She calls herself a lowly person, right? And so we need to, again, think about how these narratives and these stories are being used. So I actually haven't seen any significant similarities between the poetry of Vili and Tirupan Alvar or Chauhan and Ravitas, but this would be something um, I'd be really interested in going back and, and looking at these texts and investigating this further. Oh, thank you very much for highlighting that. With that, I would like to ask, you know, many bhakti saints and poets came from a relatively underprivileged background, Dalit or Adivasi. Does their social positioning like poets like Viliputar or Chauhan influence how they represent caste in Hindu social order? Yeah, so um, as is the case with so many pre-modern South Asian poets, we have very little reliable historical information about Vili and Chauhan. Um, so Vili may have been named after Sri Vili Putur, which is the town in Tamil Nadu that um, Sri Vaishnavas revere as the hometown of Peria Alvar and his adopted daughter Andal. Um, and according to a popular hagiographical story that was likely the product of Shaivas and has since been immortalized in T.R. Ramana's 1964 Tamil film, Arunagiri Nadar, um, according to this story, Billy was a talented yet violent Sri Vaishnava Brahmin poet who used to travel around South India cutting off inferior poets' ears after he defeated them in poetry competitions. Um, and this practice supposedly ended when Billy was unable to decipher the meaning of a verse of um, the Kandar Andadi um, of Arunagiri Nadar, who's a 15th century Tamil poet and bhakta of Shivasan, Murugan. And Arunagiri Nadar kindly refrained from slicing off Billy's ears. Um, I don't want to read these, I don't read these hagiographical stories into my interpretation of the text. It's interesting to see, but he is depicted as a Sri Vaishnava Brahmin, even in the film, right? He'll be having the specific tika that Sri Vaishnavas have. Um, and there's also another story that, um, there's a hagiographical one about um, Billy being this um, hedonist and a leper who um, one day is um, in Sri Billy Putur and it's raining and this old woman comes and saves him from his leprosy. And she's revealed to be Andal, this bhakti poet. Um, and then he dedicates his life to Sri Vaishnava traditions after this, right? Um, there's no historical evidence that these stories actually took place. Um, but Billy today, he's remembered as Billy Putra Alvar, right? So very interestingly, given the title of Alvar, and he's remembered as a Brahmin. And I think it's quite likely he was a Brahmin given um, kind of the Sanskritic influences we see in the Tamil itself. Um, and he's clearly familiar with different Sanskrit narratives. So I think it's safe to assume that he was a Brahmin. In his 1978 influential study of Bhasha literature, the Shiv Singh Suroj, um, Shiv Singh Sangar um, provides us with the following information about Chauhan. He says, some say this poet was a king, Raja, um, of Chandagar, some say of Sabalgar, member of, members of his lineage, the Bamshwale, uh, till date are in the Hardoi district. But he, but uh, Joh, um, Shiv Singh Sangar says, I don't accept this. I say, no, this poet was a Zamindar, who's a landowner in some village in Etawa, right? So in present day UP. 
Um, but Sen Sengar doesn't share his sources for these claims. He just says this. Um, but the assumptions that Johan was either a king or a zamindar are likely based on the poet's last name, right? So um, Johan, that name suggests that he was a member of the Johan clan of the Rajput community, another caste privileged Kshatriya community. Several North Indian texts, including um, Naya Chandra Suri's 15th century Sanskrit um, Hamira Mahakavya, Chand Bardai's 16th century Basha Prithviraj Raso, um, and Chandrasekhar's 17th century Sanskrit Sunjana Charita, all present kings of the Chauhan clan as these heroic Rajput warriors. So I think it's safe to assume that Billy and Chauhan were both caste privileged poets. Um, I've already noted that Billy has Duryodhana defend Karna's caste status and that Chauhan omits the story of Ekalabya. But there are also several other instances in both of these retellings where Vili and Johan keep many of this, the disturbing stories about caste-based violence from the Sanskrit Mahabharata, such as, again, the story of Kunti and the Pandavas murdering the six Nishatas. The other poets I discuss in my book, however, come from multiple different caste backgrounds. So while several of these Mahabharata poets were caste village Brahmins, um, some examples include the Marathi po poet um, Gyandev, um, the Bengali poet Kobi Sanjay, the Assamese poet Ramaswaraswati, um, they were all caste privileged Brahmins. But there are other poets, so there are the Malayalam poets um, Madhava Panikar, Rama Panikar, Shankara Panikar, the Oriya poet Saraladasa, they were Shudras, they describe themselves as Shudras in their text. Also the Malayalam poet um, Tenchutu Elutachan, uh, I'm so sorry, Marathi, I don't speak Malayalam, um, but he was likely of a mixed Brahmin and Shudra heritage. And so I hope um, that other scholars um, will investigate how the social positioning of these um, Shudra and mixed um, caste community poets influence how they um, represent caste and Hindu social order in their regional Mahabharatas. Um, until now, now, a lot of the scholarship on the Mahabharata tradition has been on the Sanskrit Mahabharata, right? Um, but in the past 2,000 years, an immeasurable amount of Mahabharatas have emerged from South and Southeast Asia. I think it's also important that we recognize this really kind of um, beautiful tradition of Mahabharata and Ramayana retellings from Southeast Asia. We've seen poem, um, this narrative in the forms of poems, dramas, sculptures, paintings, short stories, political essays, comic books, TV shows, movies, um, podcasts, YouTube videos, and Twitter threads, right? Um, and the epic, as I show in this book, was particularly popular among poets writing regional languages in pre-modern South Asia. But despite their ubiquity, however, you know, pre-modern regional Mahabharata retellings have not received the same dedicated scholarly attention that the Sanskrit Mahabharata has long attracted. Um, A.K. Ramonajan famously once said, no Hindu ever reads the Mahabharata for the first time, and when he does get to read it, he usually doesn't read it in Sanskrit, right? Um, I think it's so important to look at pre-modern Mahabharata retellings in regional languages in pre-modern South Asia, because Sanskrit literature was largely inaccessible to women and to people from caste-oppressed communities. The Sanskrit Mahabharata was created by caste-privileged Hindu men for a primarily caste-privileged patriarchal Hindu audience. And so, and while these regional Mahabharatas were written down, they were also likely performed and recited, right? And so thus making them accessible for many more people from different communities um, throughout South Asia and, and more accessible than Sanskrit Mahabharata. And so that's why I think it's paramount to examine these pre-modern regional tellings, especially when we're thinking about the audiences of these texts. I, I did not realize the timing and we are on the last question. Uh, this conversation is really, I mean, touching the hearts. Uh, I would like to ask my last question that while your book primarily focuses on Hindu Bhakti Mahabharatas, pre-modern Mahabharatas, were composed by poets from the other religious tradition. Do you discuss any of these other retelling in your book? Yes, so I do. So um, let me first return to this really fascinating element about Bash, um, Shahan's Basha retelling um, because of Aurangzeb again, right? So in the prologue of his 16th book, Chauhan describes himself performing his poem in Delhi um, before a king named Mithrasen and before Aurangzeb. And Chauhan also praises Mithrasen in the prologue of the seventh book and Aurangzeb in the prologues of the sixth, eighth, ninth, and seventeenth book out of 18 books. And so some Hindi literary historians have argued that Mithrasen was Chauhan's patron, and together they were Rajput um, Mansabdars or high ranking Mughal officials in Aurangzeb's service in Delhi. So I haven't found any evidence um, of Subal Singh Chauhan in the service of Aurangzeb nor that of a king called Mithrasen. There are some connections between um, a, uh, a king named Mithrasen and Aurangzeb. Um, and uh, actually, even in, in a text, which I discuss in my book, um, of Johan fighting with um, Jay Singh against Aurangzeb, right? So that kind of um, totally dismantles this idea that he was um, his patron. But while they, Aurangzeb and Mithrasen might not have actually patronized Johan, these allusions to these rulers in the Basha Mahabharata are still significant because they challenge prevalent modern perceptions of Aurangzeb, right? So today, Aurangzeb is remembered in India as a violent Muslim tyrant who demolished Hindu temples and brutally persecuted non-Muslims. Um, but in recent years, 
scholarship has begun to complicate this picture of Aurangzeb as a violent tormentor of Hindus. Um, and this consistent praise of Aurangzeb and Trahan's overtly Hindu Vaishnava Mahabharata further challenges contemporary stereotypes about this Mughal emperor. And I think this is very important um, given the way the Mughals are being erased um, from history in contemporary India, right? In textbooks, um, in streets being renamed um, after Mughal emperors, right? And so it's important to keep in mind um, that there are it's, it's much more complex the relationship between different religious traditions and these Mughal emperors. And there's been a lot of really great scholars about this over the years. And again, it's just very fascinating to me that we have this very Hindu Bhakti Mahabharata continuously praising Aurangzeb. Um, in my book, I show that between the beginning of the 9th and the end of the 17th century, there was a nearly continuous centering of the Mahabharata tradition around Krishna in regional South Asian languages. But I want to be clear that I am in no way suggesting that all pre-modern Mahabharatas in regional languages revolve around Krishna. And I discuss some retellings in my book that have no traces of Vaishnava devotion. Um, two of these retellings are Pampa's 10th century Kannada Vikram Arjuna Vijayam and Rana's 11th century Kannada Sahasabhima Vijayam. Pampa and Rana were both Digambra Jains, and they used their Mahabharatas to criticize a distinctly Vaishnava image of Krishna. Um, just in the 16th and 17th centuries, we see multiple retellings um, of the Mahabharata from poets from non-Hindu backgrounds. So one example includes the 1697 Pasha Band of Puran by the Jain merchant um, Bulakidas and the Gyan Prabodh, which was a composition that is within the Basha Dasam Granth, which is attributed to the 10th Sikh Guru, Guru Gobind Singh, who lived between um, 1666 and 1708. Um, the Gyan Prabodh features stories involving Yudhishthira and other Mahabharata figures. There's also a Ramayana retelling, the Ramavatar, that is also in um, the Gyan Prabodh. Sorry, not within the Gyan Pradod, within the Dasam Granth um, of Guru Gobind Singh. Um, I also discussed briefly the 16th century Persian Razam Nama that was commissioned by the third Mughal Emperor Akbar. The Mahabharata and the Ramayana are often referred to as the Hindu epics. And um, to call these narrative traditions the Hindu epics obscures the complex and fascinating ways in which Jains, Muslims, and Sikhs, Buddhists too, have retold the story of the Pandavas and retold the story of Rama to reflect different values within their own religions. Um, the Dasharatha Jataka, which is a Buddhist retelling of the Ramayana, could be as old as Valmiki's Ramayana, right? So we have um, retellings of these stories that are um, very old, some as old as the narratives themselves, right? And so I think it's especially important we recognize that there are Jain, Muslim, Buddhist, Sikh retellings of these stories, um, because uh, especially just thinking about, you know, in certain states of India, wanting to make the Bhagavad Gita compulsory for students in public schools to learn all students, regardless of their religious tradition, it's important to recognize that these narrative traditions are not just Hindu. Um, they were used and retold by members of other religious traditions as well. And it's really important that we recognize that. Uh, that was it. Uh, thank you very, very much, Dr. Ply, for joining us for this uh, tremendous conversation today. I hope uh, our listeners and audience will enjoy as much as I enjoyed and gain the insight from your book, Mahabharata, Epic Mahabharatas. And for our audience, don't forget to get the flyer in the end of this interview. Thank you. Thank you for watching.